Hello there, and welcome back to In the Shadows of Utopia. This is Series 1, The Cambodian Nightmare. I'm Lachlan Peters, and in this episode we will pick up our story of Cambodia and the events leading to the Khmer Rouge Revolution in the period after the Khmer Empire and the Golden Age of Angkor to discover what happened to Cambodia as well as the neighbouring region of Southeast Asia during an era that is sometimes referred to as the Dark Ages of Cambodian history, or perhaps more accurately as Cambodia's Middle Period. This episode will attempt to cover another 400 or so years of history, from about the 15th to the 19th century. And in doing so, we are going to have to expand the scope of the story. We're going to include the neighbouring regions that will become modern-day Thailand and Vietnam, into an explanation of how Cambodia transitions into modern history. Introducing these new frontiers will also coincide with the upcoming age of European colonialism. So we will begin to start pulling these larger scale themes into the story, as they will become increasingly relevant as we move on. What this series will attempt to do is give you an introduction to Cambodian history, and the events and themes that help explain the revolutionary period in the 1970s, that is the Pol Pot era that will be the primary focus of the podcast. But we will also set up how wider historical themes and factors have a huge influence in these regionally specific events, as they will both eventually culminate in Cambodia's darkest and most horrific era. A deep explanation of the killing fields requires almost as much explanation of world history as it does Cambodian. The focus of this episode will be how and why there was this transformation from the Khmer Empire into Cambodia, and explaining the relationship that develops between Thailand, Vietnam, and the new Cambodia in this era between ancient glory and the approaching, harsh realities of the modern world. This period of Cambodian history can almost be thought of like a childhood trauma. There are certain changes and events that will occur after the end of Angkor, and before the French colonial period, where Cambodia's spirit and ego will get damaged, traumatised even. And in the 20th century, this trauma will become extremely relevant to a kind of national nervous breakdown, where so many little facets of this story will combine to almost destroy Cambodia and its people. So unlike the last few episodes, this part of the story will not focus on Cambodia exclusively. But in doing so, we will begin to appreciate how some vitally important aspects of Cambodian history will not be decided upon by the Khmer themselves but will increasingly begin to originate in the world around them. This is episode 4, Becoming Cambodia. Okay, so you might remember from the last episode that the date 1431 gets thrown around a lot as a demarcation of a kind of end to the Angkorian period. That is to say that the period of Cambodian history centred around the megacity of Yasudharapura, also known as Angkor, which is famous, as we discussed, for its huge temples, monuments, vast artificial lakes, and the general scope of an empire that, you know, it stretched across most of mainland Southeast Asia. So why is 1431 the end date of that empire? Well, some historians think that that is the year that there was a large invasion from the civilization that is going to become modern Thailand. Basically, they sacked Angkor and took over that part of the country for a bit. 
which led the capital city to be abandoned. This story might not strictly be the case, but regardless of the actual details, there is a general feeling that this date is useful because it helps define the end of an era for Cambodian history. We discussed the possibilities of environmental factors influencing the stagnation of the complex system of causeways and reservoirs that supported the perhaps million or so inhabitants of Angkor, as well as the rise of the Thai kingdoms and their subsequent routine invasions of the Khmer Empire, and how this slowly eroded some of the dominance the kingdom had over the region. Now, the reason we're going to use the word transformation to describe this period following the Golden Age of Angkor is because what we are seeing is not really a sudden collapse or decline, but more of a series of gradual shifts and developments away from some of the more fundamental institutions that characterised the Angkorian era. What I mean by that is that some of the famous examples of what historians associate with the heights of the Khmer Empire, things like large and elaborate stone temple building, a Hindu-oriented royal family, those large hydraulic networks, even the basic structures of a society focused on heavy taxation and rice farming, these traditions seem to fade from importance or even stop altogether in the time after this period. This is sort of like when you find an old photo album, and you see some pictures of yourself and some of the clothes you're wearing or haircuts you have, and they remind you of just how much you liked a certain band or type of music at that time in your life. Like if you'd asked yourself at that age whether you would stop listening to whatever your favourite band was. Now, if you're anything like me, the answer probably would have been an assured no way, buddy. This is who I am. You know? Well, if you'd asked a king in the Angkor period whether building huge stone representations of Hindu mythology would ever be not cool, I'm sure you'd get a pretty similar answer. Civilizations, like teenagers, have a tendency to grow and transform over time. And just like you might be able to delineate your own personal heavy metal phase, my first heavy metal phase was from about 2004 to 2008, historians have a similar view of the Angkorian era based on how certain aspects of the Khmer civilization change or stop altogether following this period. So, just like you might not have stopped listening to Judas Priest overnight, a lot of these cultural changes didn't happen instantaneously. In fact, some of the transformations that Cambodian civilization would undergo probably started in the era of the greatest of the Cambodian kings, Jayavarman VII. He was the Buddhist king who expanded the empire to its greatest extent and built famous temples such as the Bayong. All of this is a kind of roundabout way of saying that Angkor didn't just end one day in 1431. There wasn't some cataclysm which caused everyone to just abandon the city and run to the forest. There was a host of different forces involved that saw the civilization begin to transform into what would eventually become modern Cambodia. And one of the clearest indications of this new direction was the shift in power of the Khmer civilization from that site around Angkor, which corresponds to the area near the modern-day city of Siem Reap, to the city that would become the new capital, and remain so into the present day, known as Phnom Penh. So, why Phnom Penh? Well, again, this is a little easier to imagine if you have a bit of familiarity with the geography of the region, or a map handy, but basically, if you recall how we talked about the Great Lake of Cambodia, known as the Ton Le Sap, if you follow the tributary river of that lake down toward the centre of Cambodia, this river connects with the Mekong River, which is a big one. From there, the Mekong River flows down south into a complex delta, which again flows into the South China Sea. Without getting into too much detail here, I should also mention that the Mekong is of huge environmental importance to the region, and is second only to the Amazon River in terms of biodiversity. But if we're talking about this location's utility in relation to the transformation of Cambodia in this era, well... Shifting the capital toward the confluence of the Tonle Sap and the Mekong rivers 
provides the opportunity for your civilization to focus less on basing your whole economy on rice production and the system of taxation of that crop, and more toward becoming a trading kingdom. What you've effectively done by setting up your capital in Phnom Penh rather than Angkor is taking control of this massive highway that runs through your country, down from Laos and into the South China Sea. Now, you've still got access inland to the Great Lake and to Angkor, but you've also set up this massive area where you can take advantage of the trade with China, which has greatly expanded in this period, and really integrate yourself into an economic system that's burgeoning. Legend has it that Phnom Penh was founded after an old woman named Lady Penh discovered a tree floating down the Tonle Sap River after a storm. Inside the tree, she found images of the Buddha, and taking this as a miraculous sign, she had the tree used to build a temple on a small hill to house these images of the Buddha. This temple is known as Wat Phnom, and although it has been rebuilt several times, it's still an important feature of the modern-day capital. The name, Phnom Penh, means Phnom's Hill, in reference to the temple on the hill built by Lady Penh. Now, you can decide for yourself whether Lady Penh really did find that tree floating down the river, but the date we have for Phnom Penh being established is around 1371, which is roughly 60 years before the major Thai invasion that sacked Angkor and led the Khmer king Ponhi Yat to move the capital from there to Phnom Penh. So that's sort of what's going on right after the so-called Angkor period ends. But it's also where we can address what's going on with Angkor and the relationship that is developing between the Thai kingdoms that used to pay tribute to the Khmer Empire, but are now beginning to rival their former masters. I previously mentioned that there was a large Thai invasion of Angkor in 1431, but it seems like their administration of the city only lasted about 20 years before a Khmer army came back and overthrew them. However, once Yasud Harapura was reclaimed, its status as capital was not restored. Phnom Penh would remain the seat of the royals in Cambodia. The period following this sack and resack of Angkor could kind of be described as the two kingdoms, one new and one old, kind of figuring each other out. Remember, the rise of the Thai kingdoms was a relatively recent process. The original tribes had migrated from southwestern China from around the 11th century. Meanwhile, the Khmer in this new, strange, post-glory days phase, where the civilization is looking for sure footing. This is a slightly complex idea, so I'm going to rely on historian David Chandler's insights into the period from his book, A History of Cambodia. In this section, he's talking about the relationship between the newly established trading kingdoms of the Thai and Khmer, and an idea he calls the emulation factor. Quote, By the 1400s, the Thai capital and these new Cambodian cities looked to each other rather than to a Brahmanical past for exemplary behaviour. Until the end of the 16th century, moreover, Phnom Penh and the Thai capital considered themselves not separate polities, but participants in a hybrid culture. The mixture contained elements of Hinduized kingship, traceable to Angkor, and Theravada monarchic accessibility, traceable to the Mon kingdoms, which are a sort of group in Burma, and had practiced Theravada Buddhism for almost a thousand years, as well as remnants of paternalistic, village-oriented leadership traceable to the ethnic forerunners of the Thai. Throughout the 14th and 15th century, the official language common to both kingdoms was probably Khmer. In both societies, the Buddhist Sangha, or monastic order, was accessible in its lower reaches to ordinary people. Brought into contact with each other through wars, immigration, and a shared religion, the newly established Thai and Khmer kingdoms blended with each other and developed differently from their separate forebears. End quote. So, what Chandler is saying here is that there is a kind of cultural blending going on in this period that represents a departure from what we considered as the hallmarks of the old Khmer Empire. 
which, again, cannot be thought of within any modern notions of what a country or state correspond with. But there is a much more fluid period of history, and the movement of people, ideas, and religions in this period highlights this sort of blending dynamic between the Thai kingdoms and the Khmer. Chandler goes on to say that this sort of cultural blend was rarely peaceful. So, you know, just because we share some ideas and customs, don't think we are going to be competing here. Between the 14th and 19th centuries, there were frequent wars between the two kingdoms. And it should be noted here that the Khmer were winning some of them too. So you can imagine two fighters kind of circling each other in the ring, throwing the occasional punch and analysing the opponent's reaction. What this relationship between the Khmer and the Thai in this period also emphasises is that a strict interpretation of the Khmer civilization just collapsing into decline and powerlessness after Angkor ceased to be the capital, well, that kind of doesn't correspond to the reality of the history in this period. In this post-Angkor phase, the Thai kingdoms, or Siam, as I might dip in and out of calling them, basically become the primary enemies of the Khmer. However, this is a complex relationship, as this cultural blend would suggest. For instance, sometimes a Cambodian monarch might seek refuge in the court of Siam after being usurped in Phnom Penh. He might lay low there for a while before being assisted in taking back the throne, after which he would be indebted to his Siamese benefactors for a while. And this is an important thing to realise because it's not just between Cambodia and Thailand that this happens. It'll be, say, Thai kings that also need this kind of assistance, or even Vietnamese kings that will, you know, follow this same kind of idea where you'll lay low in one of these neighbouring kingdoms until you can gather up enough forces and re-enter your own country and try and take back the throne. So bear that in mind throughout this period that there's a lot of sort of peaceful and useful interactions going on between all of these kingdoms, not just conquering territory and warfare. As we move into the 16th century, we start seeing the first contact between Cambodia and Europeans during the so-called Age of Discovery. I believe it's a Portuguese admiral who, after conquering the Malaysian city of Malacca in 1511, pays a visit to Cambodia during his trip to Indochina. So this Age of Discovery is usually defined by, say, the first circumnavigation of the globe occurring in 1522 by Vasco da Gama, before that, Christopher Columbus had his voyages to the Americas in 1492 and 1502. Now, I don't want to gloss over what is a fairly disastrous circumstance for many peoples around the world as a result of this age of discovery. Things like the spread of disease or the Atlantic slave trade. But as it's not yet directly relevant to the story in Cambodia, we can return to these larger forces at play and basically the beginnings of globalization and imperialism and colonialism, and how it relates to Cambodia, we'll, we'll do that later on in the episode. I kind of, for now, want to just remain focused on Thailand, Cambodia, and eventually Vietnam, until we are sort of set up to introduce these larger elements. So, in the middle of the 1500s, Cambodia sees one of the more illustrious kings of the post-Angkor era. His name is King Chan I, and he manages to push back the Siamese all the way back to their capital of Ayutthaya, but there he discovers that the Burmese have already invaded that territory. When King Cham would eventually die in 1566, Cambodia was in a, a peaceful and pretty good position. They turned a new capital into a flourishing trading post. This city, known as Levec, located sort of in between Phnom Penh and toward the Great Lake, would remain the capital for about 70 years and maintain communities from many different countries like China, Malaysia, Japan, Spaniards, English, Dutch and Portuguese people there as well. However, because the successes of Chan would continue to try and invade Siam, these raids would eventually lead to a full-on retaliatory invasion from the Thai kingdoms that would subjugate the entire country by 1594. Now, just as a little side note here, during this war between Siam and Cambodia, the Khmer Prince Soriopor is enlisting the help of Spanish and Portuguese mercenaries during this conflict. So we're now well into an era where these wars fought between neighbouring states in Asia 
will now be influenced by Europeans and technology like cannons and things like that. This leads us to kinds of fantastic, not fan, I'm not sure if that's the right word, but these kinds of epic battles that now have, you know, artillery bombardments as well as battle elephants storming in and breaking down city gates for infantry to then storm through as well. The result of this for Cambodia is devastating, however, as more than 90,000 prisoners of war, including the Khmer Prince, are taken as hostage back to Siam, continuing this kind of huge forced movements that we'd been seeing between these states for centuries now. The sacking of Levesque at the end of the 16th century kind of marks the end of Cambodia's position of relative strength in the post-Angkor period. If we're using that analogy of the Khmers and the Siamese as two fighters in a ring, kind of testing out the other one, well, the Khmers have gone for a huge hit become unbalanced, and the Siamese fighter has done a big old kick or something right to the head. The Khmer fighter won't be knocked out entirely, but when he sort of collects himself and stands up again, there is going to be a Siamese guy waiting there for him, as well as a new fighter that has stepped in and wants to get into this fight. So it's become this battle royale kind of three-way battle. So the 17th century will be the beginning of this scenario where the Khmer are just taking punches from both sides, dodging out of the way sometimes, letting the other guys fight each other, and basically just trying to survive in this, because the other two guys are much stronger, they're faster, and they're heavier. And after a period of Cambodia basically being reduced to a a vassal state under the Thai kingdom, the situation evolves slightly so that the Khmers regain a little autonomy and their old territory, so it's not like they just became part of Siam, But the ebb and flow of power was becoming less and less determined by a centralised Khmer political force and becoming more and more undermined and influenced by its now much more powerful Siamese neighbour in the West. However, they are also having to deal more and more with the rising power coming from the East. By the middle of the 1600s, Cambodia was being squeezed by both sides. The eastern region of the once vast empire is now beginning to be swallowed up by the increasingly powerful proto-Vietnamese states, and it sort of becomes imperative for this story to now go on a small tangent toward this fascinating area of the world and explain briefly what Vietnam has been doing for the past 1500 years and how they would become the hereditary enemy of Cambodia. What's Vietnam? A question a child might ask, but not a childish question. A question that in the past has led not to answers, but only to other questions. What were we fighting for? Why didn't we just drop the bomb? How could we fight an enemy we couldn't even see? Did all those people die? So the clip that you just heard is from a commercial for a series of books by Time Life in the 1980s. Some of you might have heard that pretty iconic quote, uh, a question a child might ask, but not a childish question, from other pop culture references. But the whole what's Vietnam part of it stuck with me when I heard it during my childhood, even though it was on a cartoon in the 90s. And I think that's because in the Western cultural psyche, we're exposed to this relatively small idea of Vietnam, not so much as a country with a rich and long history, but as a war. So like, Even the mention of the word Vietnam might have your brain start accessing its built-in music collection and automatically playing something by the Rolling Stones or Jimi Hendrix. Or maybe the automatic move for your brain is the box of movies and scenes from Apocalypse Now, Platoon, Full Metal Jacket. These are all starting to be queued up in your mind. 
And all of this makes sense. I mean, it's pretty much 50 years of exposure to these iconic images and sounds associated with Vietnam. But it is a little rare that the history of this country is explored without reference to the 20th century and relation to the West, be that France or the United States. Naturally, this podcast will eventually have to dig in deep with the role that Vietnam plays in the Cold War, but the country will also be of huge importance to the story of Cambodia, well before Indochina becomes the focus of foreign powers. So, not only will Vietnam act as a kind of conduit for the big history themes of this series to be channeled through, and particularly how they are then related into Cambodian history, But Vietnam is also hugely important on this smaller regional stage, where the context surrounding the relationship between the people in this region will also play a large role in how this story plays out. So in this dual sense, the idea of Vietnam, as it is commonly thought of in the West, you know, the guitars, machine gun fire, helicopters, the bright explosions of jungle, the horror and guilt that hangs in the Western consciousness about this war, All of that, it's hugely relevant to the story of Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge Revolution. But so is the Cambodian idea of Vietnam, as a kind of national boogeyman. You might remember what Sihanouk said in that interview I included in the introduction episode, where the leader of Cambodia said something along the lines of, the Vietnamese, whether red or blue, he means either capitalist or communist, have this desire to come into Cambodia and occupy our land. The story of the Cambodian Revolution requires significant attention to be paid to the relationship of Cambodia to its eastern neighbour, centuries before any fictional colonel will tell us about how much he likes the smell of napalm in the morning. So, with that in mind, we're going to sort of catch ourselves up on where Vietnam is at this point in the story, and basically start from the beginning, because as the story goes on, Vietnam will become increasingly relevant to the history of Cambodia, and we need to begin setting up some of these themes long in advance. Alright, so first things first. The territory that is now known as Vietnam covers the relatively thin region on the eastern side of the Southeast Asian mainland. Today, the country kind of takes the shape of an S on the map, on the top bordering China and Laos, while the bottom section of the S rests against Cambodia's eastern and southern border. Much like Cambodia's current borders, the Vietnamese ones have changed considerably depending on how far back we want to look. So if we begin the Vietnamese story at around the same time as we started the Cambodian one, that is about 2000 or 2500 years ago, then the early predecessor of Vietnam is ruled by the Hong Bong dynasty, and the territory there is known as Van Lang. There is an extremely fertile area in the north of the country known as the Red River Delta, and there have probably been people living in this region for hundreds of thousands of years, to the extent that we're talking about fossils of pre-Homo sapiens being found in this region. Anyway, by about 1000 BC, we can start seeing wet rice cultivation, bronze casting, and a distinct culture and assembly of kingdoms appearing in that top part of the S in that region. So the country starts out being situated only in that very top section of what the territory would eventually encompass. However, unlike the Khmer who sort of had their own thing going on for a thousand years or so, where there was a civilization developing their own kingdom and culture, which had influences from other sources, yeah, but without necessarily ever being actually dominated by these outside influences. The early history of Vietnam in the same time frame, that is from about 179 BC to 938 AD, well, that time period is one that is completely dominated by the Chinese. So if you remember in the first episode about ancient Khmer history, we talked about how these relatively smaller countries on the Southeast Asian mainland known as Indochina for a long time, a sandwich between cultural and civilizational heavyweights, India and China. I referred to a process known as Indianization, which was this kind of osmosis between the early Khmer culture 
and the Indian states to the west, which led to things like religion, writing, even some elements of societal organisation being heavily influenced by that process. But there's no Indian king who came and took over the Cambodian region and said that this was how it was going to get done. Whereas in Vietnam, China was the primary cultural influence in the similar time period, but this was not achieved through peaceful means. As I said, this would-be predecessor of Vietnam was essentially a colony of China. There were periods of war and revolt between the two, as well as relatively calm and peaceful, harmonious times. But the result of this relationship was that Vietnamese society was going to be heavily influenced by a 1,000-year domination by the Chinese. This opens up to one of the first kind of big history themes associated with the Vietnamese and the collective memory of this nation, as one that you can sort of call a culture of defiance or a national narrative that is this strong theme concerned with independence. Even from a relatively early period, around 40 AD, the Trung sisters, two highly educated women proficient in martial arts, are considered national heroes for rebelling against the first Chinese domination of the early Vietnamese state. Naturally, this theme will be explicit again in the 20th century, but for now, what I'm trying to establish is that there is a significant cultural divide between the Khmer and the Vietnamese in this era, and it can be largely based upon the cultures they are drawing influence from, as well as how these larger cultures imparted that influence. This period of Chinese dominance lasts until around 938 AD, when No Quien won a fascinating battle against the southern Han dynasty army at the Bakdang River. There, this 33-year-old general, who had risen quickly through the ranks, was able to utterly devastate an approaching Chinese army that was coming to quell a Vietnamese uprising in the vicinity of the Red River Delta. So while the Chinese are bringing this large army, around 20,000 men, down a river toward the area, the young and talented No Quien foresaw this manoeuvre and came up with a pretty great plan to beat the larger and more advanced naval army. Now, what the Vietnamese general did was gather a bunch of his men and headed down to the mouth of the river that he knew the Chinese boats would have to come through. When the river was at very low tide, he had his men plant hundreds of huge, strong, iron-tipped pikes over a large section of the riverbed. Once the pikes had been secured, his men retreated and let the river rise up again to high tide. As the river rose, the pikes became invisible under the water. Later, as the huge Chinese navy arrived in the area, Nyo Kui En set up his much smaller ships just ahead of the underwater trap and lured the larger Chinese army toward them. Having calculated exactly when the river would recede into low tide again, the Vietnamese general turned his ships around to engage the Chinese navy just as they hovered above the pikes. As the battle began, it seemed that the much larger navy would obviously win. That is, of course, until the tide went out. All of the large Chinese ships became stranded or punctured by the huge iron pikes. As many began to sink, the Vietnamese general ordered masses of hidden archers and soldiers to come out of their hiding positions along the riverbank and start firing huge barrages or arrows down onto the skewered ships. Eventually, his forces completely overran the entire Chinese fleet and slaughtered most of them, including Liu Hong Kao, the leader of the Southern Han army and the son of the Chinese emperor. This was a huge victory, and one that relied on an exquisite understanding of the environment to produce an ingenious way of besting a much larger and more technologically advanced army. The use of hidden pointed sticks by the Vietnamese might sound like a familiar tactic to those aware of some of the guerrilla tactics that would be employed about a thousand years later. But like I said earlier, you have this narrative starting to emerge where the Vietnamese will struggle for independence against a larger, more dominant foe. And after this huge victory, the early predecessor of the Vietnamese state is proclaimed independent from China and renamed Dai Viet. 
meaning Great Viet, by No Quien, who then becomes king of this new land. Soon after this victorious independent era began, a period called Dynastic Vietnam by historians, Dai Viet would enter a kind of golden era under the Li dynasty, and then the Tran dynasty. During this period, we see the continuation of a Vietnamese style of Chinese statecraft and laws, while Confucianism remains a spiritual element in the region, as well as Taoism and Mahayana Buddhism. As you might remember that the Khmer were more influenced by Hindu beliefs, and eventually the Theravada strand of Buddhism that will take hold. This golden era of dynastic Vietnam continues for hundreds of years, briefly interrupted by a few Mongol invasions or from Ming China, but basically the kingdom remains strong and flourishes. And this early Vietnamese state, which remember was just the top of that S on the eastern side of Southeast Asia, eventually begins expanding south in a process of annexation known as Nam Tien, literally southward expansion. This march to the south, as it is commonly referred to, will see the Vietnamese completely defeat the kingdom of Champa in 1471. If you recall, the kingdom of Champa occupied that middle to bottom area of the S-shaped country that Vietnam would eventually become. And the people there were a big player in the region from around the second century. Remember, it was the Chams from Champa who King Jayavarman VII defeated on the Tonle Sap, and after that he went on to use that victory to propel the Khmer into their own golden era. The Chams were culturally more similar to the Khmer than the Vietnamese, with similar influences from India and Java, but also from Arab traders, who would introduce Islam to this region in around the 10th century. Islam would eventually become the religion of the Chams, even until today, where in the communities which still exist in Cambodia and Vietnam, there is a fervent adherence to the faith. Anyway, the Cham were, you know, like, back in the day, a part of the big boys, for centuries really, until this gradual expansion south from Vietnam would eventually result in the complete destruction of their kingdom. This cham Dai Viet War in 1471 is probably the most decisive one. It involves something like 300,000 Dai Viet against about a 100,000 strong Cham army. And the Dai Viet under Emperor Li Tan Tong utterly destroys much of the kingdom. The Chams appeal to China, who only verbally rebuke the Vietnamese, who will go on to slaughter more than 60,000 Chams in the capital. After this, there are very few pockets of territory that remain under Cham control, but even these are completely annexed over the next few hundred years. This annex of Champa has been called genocide by some historians, including one of the most well-known scholars of Cambodian history, an Australian and fellow alumni of Monash University, Ben Kiernan. But by all accounts, the war sounds absolutely brutal and ruthless on behalf of the Dai Viet. As I said, it didn't quite end in the 15th century, and over the next 250 years or so, the Vietnamese would continue smashing the remaining Cham territories or assimilating the Cham people, until about 1692, when the surviving Cham royalty and around 5,000 others flee into Cambodian territory, and maybe 50,000 or so other unassimilated Chams remain in a small area on the southern coast of what is now today Vietnam. After the Dai Viet had consolidated most of that Cham territory into their own, that left the Khmer's eastern border to be resting alongside this expanding Vietnamese state. By the 1620s, there was a kind of split between a northern faction in Vietnam known as the Li Dynasty and a southern one known as the Nguyen Lords. There was a civil war between the north and south of Vietnam, and during this period, the southern Nguyen Lords began slowly encroaching into Khmer territory, eventually taking over a Khmer city known as Pre Nacor which is the modern-day Vietnamese city of Saigon, or Ho Chi Minh City. And this process of taking Khmer territory is done in a way that may have been seen as civilizing from the Vietnamese perspective. This period of Vietnamese expansion into Khmer territory coincided with the Khmer's relative weakness after being subjugated by the Siamese after the sacking of Lovec. This process would continue for a couple of hundred years, 
And in taking over this sort of rump of Cambodia, Vietnam will complete that final curve on the bottom of that S-shape, absorbing the hugely important Mekong Delta, not to mention tens of thousands of ethnic Khmer, who remain in this region, which is still known to Cambodians today as Kampuchea Krom, or Lower Cambodia. Now this resulting split between the north and south of Vietnam following this expansion will lead to about a century of civil war and strife for these different clans in the north and south, before they are reunited under one dynastic ruler again. Basically, the two powerful families that came to control the north and the new southern lands of Vietnam would effectively partition the country into their own spheres of influence. While not being constantly at war with one another, the Nguyen lords in the south and the Trinh lords in the north would see various societal accomplishments occur during this period. Both sides were open to foreign influence and technology, not just military ones, but also centralised government offices in control of, say, budgets or producing currency, uh, utilising the decimal system for weights, compiling history books. It's an important period of modernization for the Vietnamese, regardless of what side they are on. This civil war would culminate with the Nguyen lords, the southern rulers, eventually defeating the northern lords and establishing sovereignty over the entirety of Vietnam. Events leading to this unification, particularly the last 25 years or so, will really stretch the scope of this story to fairly far-flung locales and themes. So what we will do is follow the story of a French missionary stationed on the southern coast of Vietnam and look at his role in helping a 15-year-old southern Vietnamese prince to eventually ascend to this throne and unify Vietnam. The story of this Catholic priest, who is commonly known as Pignot de Balhain, will function as our introduction to another big character in this story, France, and set up our discussion of the French colonisation of Indochina in the next episode. So we're going to plant a flag here in the Vietnamese part of this story for now, and we will return to the unification of Vietnam, and the early processes which lead to the whole region coming under the control of France. But before we begin to dabble in that complex idea that's France, we're going to just end this episode returning back to Cambodia in the 17th and 18th centuries, just to show you how this relationship to its neighbours is developing. Because it's in around this era that if we return to the boxing analogy that we were using earlier, well... Cambodia's arms are tied behind its back, and basically, each of the other fighters is using Cambodia as a human shield to block the incoming blows from the other fighter, and it's a situation that's going to last for a long time, setting up Cambodia for the 20th century. So as the 17th century ends, we have this scenario where the access to the sea for Cambodia has been cut off by the southern Vietnamese. This area containing the Mekong Delta is such a big deal, not only because of the people and territory you lose, but also because you lose access to the booming trade opportunities which have become such a relevant modernising factor for Asian economies and societies in this time period. So, over the few hundred years since the glory days of the Khmer Empire, the Khmer have been pushed east by the Siamese, then back to the west, then back east again. They've lost control of their territory, and are now practically at the mercy of a new kingdom who encroaches further and further into their land. Meanwhile, the western region of Cambodia, Battambang, even the areas around Siem Reap, which, as I said earlier, is the province that contains Angkor, at this time, this area also comes under the control of Siam. So the court at Phnom Penh is sort of in this vice grip scenario, where everything is getting squeezed from both sides. The royal family in Phnom Penh, when it was stable and not marred by infighting, betrayals and power struggles, which it was basically all of the time, was often looking to the Siamese to the west 
when they needed help repelling an invasion from the Vietnamese in the east. Or perhaps the tables would turn and a new king would seek to reclaim the throne by siding with the Vietnamese in order to beat a Siamese-backed ruler. Cambodia becomes this kind of buffer between Vietnam and Siam, where the Khmer have ceased to be a threat to these countries, but are more of a stage for these now more powerful states to use to attack each other. It's in this time that the royal family in Phnom Penh becomes much less revered by the average person out in the villages. In comparison to Angkorian Cambodia, the level of centralised state control is significantly weaker. So what is going on for the general Cambodian population during this period? That is, the people outside of the capital city, and in the districts in the countryside. Well, the people were still mostly subsistence farmers, rural trade was still done in barter rather than with money, which was only used in the city and by some minority groups. The large irrigation work, which were emblematic of the ancient Angkor period, was seldom used and farmers usually had kind of small plots of land where the men and women who tended them would work side by side. Yields were low and surpluses were rare. There weren't really roads to speak of either until the 1830s, and there was no incentive and little technology for farmers to use to vary their crops, sell their surpluses, or increase their holdings. Meanwhile, bandits, armies, or officials would often carry off any surpluses that they could find when they passed through. This leads historian David Chandler to write in A History of Cambodia, quote, By the standards of Southeast Asia at the time, Cambodia was poor. Unlike Burma and Laos, its soil contained few gems or precious metals. Unlike Siam, its manufacturing, trade, and commerce were underdeveloped, and finished goods like brassware, porcelain, and firearms all came from abroad. Unlike Vietnam, Cambodia's communications were poor, and its internal markets were also comparatively underdeveloped. End quote. The Vietnamese emperor in 1834 would say that Cambodia was, quote, truly a barbarian country, because the people do not know the proper way to grow food. They use mattocks and hoes, but no oxen. They grow enough rice to have two meals a day, but they do not know how to store rice for an emergency. End quote. So the impression here is twofold. First, we are starting to see this, well, this perception that the Khmer aren't doing that great in this era. The fall from grace is real. The population looks a little static, disconnected. The Vietnamese are conquering parts of their territory and almost seeing it like they're doing the Khmer people in these villages a favour. This in turn leads to Khmer ideas that the Vietnamese are treating them like garbage, looking down at them and taking over their country, which leads to a growing resentment to this eastern neighbour. There is a really famous story that goes along with some of this growing resentment. Some of you familiar with the history might have heard this before. It's often called the Master's Tea. This story, or folktale, is about three Cambodians being held captive by a group of Vietnamese. What happens is that the Cambodians have been buried up to their necks in dirt, and in a way so that their heads are touching and forming a kind of human tripod. Then, on top of this makeshift tripod, the Vietnamese, or Yuan, which is a derogatory term that would be usually used when they are being referred to here. Well, they place an iron kettle on top of the men's heads that they'd buried, and they light a fire beneath it. The story goes that as the Cambodian captives begin to writhe in pain, suffering and burning, they also begin to shake their heads in agony. Which is when the Vietnamese say, Ah, careful not to move, or you will spill the master's tea. Okay, so naturally this story isn't true, but that doesn't mean that, like many pieces of folklore, it wasn't tacitly believed or repeated as a kind of stereotype or nationalist theme regarding the Vietnamese. In fact, the story would even be included in a 1978 document produced by Democratic Kampuchea about the Vietnamese called The Black Paper. Anthropologist Alexander Hinton gets 
pretty deep on this story and what it means in his book, Why Did They Kill? So I'll read you a passage here as he illustrates some of the meaning behind this popular folktale and how it relays the kind of real contempt, anger and hatred of the Vietnamese that's ingrained into the Cambodian national narrative. Quote, The legend of the Master's Tea embodies a number of Khmer nationalist themes regarding the Vietnamese. First, their evil nature is shown through sadistically burning and inflicting incredible suffering upon the helpless victims. Second, their attitude toward Cambodians is shown, i.e. scorn, superiority, and lack of sympathy. Third, their desire to destroy Cambodia and its people. It also symbolises the Khmer's historical loss of face, seen in the abuse of the victim's head, which in Southeast Asian bodily symbols represents hierarchy and respect. It also conveys Cambodia's constrictive geographical location in that they are buried up to their neck in sand. And finally, it symbolises Cambodia's victim status and the emotional heat that these conditions generated, shown in the writhing in flames, which is an embodied metaphor for shame and anger. End quote. Another version of these kinds of anti-Vietnamese folk tales was the idea that sugar palm trees, emblematic of Cambodia, will stop growing a few miles before the border with Vietnam. And this is apparently because the trees just don't want to grow there. The author of a great biography of Pol Pot, journalist uh, Philip Short, he explains this really well when he says, quote, This was more than just racial antipathy. This was a massive national inferiority complex, which took refuge in dreams of ancient grandeur. The cultural fracture between the two peoples, between Confucianism and Theravada Buddhism, between the Chinese world and the Indian, was one of mutual incomprehension and distrust, which periodically exploded into racial massacres and pogroms. End quote. This theme of a fracture between Cambodia and Vietnam will become increasingly important throughout the series. So let's put another flag in it for now, and it will become one of the main reasons that democratic Kampuchea ends up collapsing. I just wanted to have the basics of this in place right from an early point in the story. But as we begin wrapping up this episode, I just want this theme really firmly in place before we revisit the unification of Vietnam and the upcoming colonial presence of France in the next episode. So we're leaving this episode at the beginning of a real crisis for Cambodia in the 19th century. In around 1810, we have this scenario where Siam and Vietnam become roughly similar in power and prestige, and both of these kingdoms begin to see Cambodia as weak, like a dependent child. However, in the minds of the Thai, there was an overlap in regards to the Khmer's Buddhist religion and a fair bit of shared culture between the two kingdoms. So there's perhaps less antipathy from that Western side. The Thai just kind of want Cambodia to be loyal to them. However, the Vietnamese are looking more like they expect Cambodian admissions to their superiority, as well as more access to Cambodia's land. The effect will be a shutting off of Cambodia during this era, leaving them in a stunted position at the turn of the 20th century. This dynamic between the three kingdoms is recorded in a chronicle from the time, and summed up by the Emperor of Vietnam, who said, Cambodia is a small country, and we should maintain it as a child. We will be its mother, its father will be Siam. When a child has trouble with its father, it can get rid of suffering by embracing its mother. When the child is unhappy with its mother, it can run to its father for support. The scenario couldn't last for long, however, and this game of going from one parent to another would eventually lead to Cambodia becoming less and less capable of controlling its own affairs. And for a period in the 1840s, Cambodia will cease to exist as a recognisable state, when much of its territory including the capital region of Phnom Penh, will be completely administered as a component of Vietnam. So we're going to end part one of this episode there. 
with Cambodia struggling to stay above water in this post-Angkor period, and the resentment that has begun to build up against its well-to-do neighbours. In part two, we will return to Vietnam and learn how a French Catholic priest helped unify the country, and what this would mean for Indochina in the years leading into the 20th century. This was episode four of In the Shadows of Utopia, series one, The Cambodian Nightmare. This is Lachlan Peters, and if you have any questions or comments about the show, feel free to email me at shadowsofutopiapodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you.